It's obviously focused on MXGP now. I guess your overall thoughts, Matt. We haven't spoken for a little while about MXGP, but obviously Prado and Adamo both getting it done, both under the Smets training program. Pretty impressive what they've done. I've got a couple of stats for you, mate. Just sort of sums up Prado. I believe he only won two overalls, but it was a lot of those weekends. He's obviously winning two out of the three races when you include the qualifying race. You know, qualifying race points, 155. He got February 130. Laps led was Prado 219. Fevre 181, but Prado only 60 in the second motos and 159 of those laps were in the first motos. Pretty interesting stuff like qualifying race average finish 2.38, qualifying race average first lap position 1.83, just those starts. And this one probably sort of sums it up, mate. Qualifying race lap sled, Prado 136, Fevre 44, Hurlings 15. So Take of that what you will. Pretty interesting stuff. Sums it up how well he got through the season and did what he had to do, mate. So just your take on MXGP to finalize the season and what was your thoughts on it? Yeah, I mean, overall, it was uh, I, it was the year of Prado, right? Like, uh, to me, when I look back on it and try to summarize it, you know, I think he was able to go with and battle with whoever he needed to, whether it was Jeffrey or Fevra or whoever, when when he needed to. And the rest of the time, he managed the series, which is really important. You think about a series that lasts that long over that, you know, different countries, different tracks. You're going to be sick some weekends. You're going to have, you know, every problem is going to be thrown at you at some point over the course of that much racing. And he kind of all took it in stride, right? I, I think he was the master of a new format, right? He really capitalized on those Saturday races, which we figured he would, right? It really makes sense for what his strength set is. Uh, but he did the, he, he just had so many Saturday wins that for anybody, uh, doesn't matter what your name is, uh, you know, how, or how well you did on Sundays, overcoming Prado's success on Saturday to me was the biggest factor. Uh, because there were many weekends where I, I think Febra was the best rider. There were weekends where I thought Jeffrey was the best rider, but Prado was always in the balance. But guess what? On Saturday, he made up points that those guys would have to try to claw back on Sunday. And if you consistently, consistently put yourself in a plus position on Saturday night. And then they have to, they have to fight back before the gate even drops on Sunday. That's really, really challenging. It doesn't leave you any wiggle room for a mistake, right? Because he would win on Saturday and th those guys would wake up on Sunday knowing, okay, well I have to have a perfect day because I'm starting in a hole on the weekend right now. Um, so it just, it played perfectly into Prado's hands. He managed the situation from start to finish. You never really saw him blink, even when Febra won five races in a row. Prado was just hanging in there, right? I think he, he came down to 80 or 90 points at one point. Prado was just like, yeah, it's okay. I'm fine. Like, you, you never saw panic or stress or anything. Uh, and he just he just did his thing. So, moving forward for him, he, he knows the roadmap now. You know, that Saturday uh, aspect really, I think, gives him such a distinct advantage uh, just because it's it's exactly what he's good at doing. Get a start, and he can go flat out for 15 minutes, and, and most people can't deal with that onslaught. Um, you know, and then he, he set up nicely for Sunday. So it'll be a, un a new year. It's really tough, tough to win back-to-back -back anything um, because every race he's going to have a bullseye on his back, and Jeffrey will likely be healthy and all those things. Uh, but regardless, he is now a world champion and no one can ever take it away. And, and, you know, I was one of the guys that always, I was always wondering if in the MXGP class with the best guys and such a long series and dealing with, you know, I was wondered how he could deal with the heat and deal with all these extreme conditions. There's nothing, you know, even his biggest detractors can say anymore. He accomplished the goal. He was able to beat Jeffrey when Jeffrey was there. He beat, you know, February was champion. There's, there's really not, you know, there, there are no caveats. There are no asterisks. He's a world champion and that's enough. You know, if he never wins one again, guess what? It's enough. He, he is a, he's a world champion and he deserves it. I, I have nothing but praise to give him. Yeah, well said, mate. And just throw it to you, James, on MX2. Obviously, Adamo got it done, deserving champion, you know, had a great mindset. He was sort of going through the weekends, just being really consistent and not getting too overawed by the occasion. He had that little slip up, I believe it was in Latvia when he had the red plate, but he got over that, recalibrated, and he had that really formidable mindset and he stayed healthy because, you know, listening to him in the press conference, he would say he didn't mind if he got passed. As long as he still got a good position, he's like, I did what I had to do, nothing more. So, and I guess the stats that I'll just quickly tell you now, mate, sort of bear that out. Obviously, qualifying race points, Simon got 131, Yago 122, Adamo was back there on 115, despite those guys missing so many races. And then the laps led this one sort of 
struck the chord, particularly Yago 208, Simon Langenfelder 141, Kuhn 91, Adamo only 66 laps led in the moto. It seems quite staggering and qualifying race laps led. Adamo only led seven and Yago 73, Simon 57. So your talk on that, James, because there was pretty interesting stuff there. Yago, another missed opportunity and so many guys will feel that too, won't they? Yeah, I think that's the, I think that's the case. You know, Yago, um, you know, everybody would literally just had, you know, it, it, if you were a better man at the start of the year, you were saying this is Yago's championship to lose. And unfortunately, that's exactly what, what happened. Um, but I don't want to take anything away from Adamo because you have to take your opportunities. And, and if you rewind back to November, he he took he went to uh, to Lommel with 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 Tony and pound that laps. You know, he he knew he needed to improve his sand game because that was the one thing that was lacking. That was the the the, the piece what was missing in his um in his skill set. So you know, spending like six weeks in the cold Lommel uh, sand is like, no one wants to be doing that. But, you know, I think, I think it was like near enough two months in the end that he just literally spent there just smashing out laps every single day. So he knew what was, so coming to this, this year, obviously on the KTM, fantastic bike. We've, we've seen so many champions on it before, especially with like Vial coming from EMX 250, where he finished like ninth overall or something and then winning the world championship the year after. The bike's good. We know that. But you still have to perform. And, and I think what was key, like I got to know Adamo over the last seven years. And um, he's just, he, he just has this winning mentality. You know, it's, it's, he knows, what he, he doesn't shy away from hard work. He knows what he needs to do. Everything else is, it plays second to him achieving his dream. And, and he's just been driven by his dream for the last seven years from, from being like a like 13 year old on a Honda 150. So, I think what was really impressive was the way that he uh, understood what he was lacking. He he made those um, he, he made those uh, amendments over the uh, over the uh, preseason. But I think what's key is you know same thing with Prado is he took the opportunities this year. He had to be he was consistent. He it, although it wasn't lots of laps led, he was always around the top three. Uh, didn't drop too many points. And really just to put the pressure on everybody else, like, you know, Benestant, when we've seen that performance of Benestant in France, we really thought at this point, Benestant's going to go on and, and, and really like mount a challenge to, to Iago. Uh, on the sets, on the same weekend, Iago's um, title chances when he went down the back hill and crashed, that was the, the, the end. Up to that point, he was, we were just in awe of, of Iago. This new guy, this new Iago came out, no mistakes, uh, riding within his means. And we know what, you know, the rest is history. But I, I don't think you can take anything away from Adamo. I think he knew what he needed to do this year and he absolutely smashed it. And inconsistency is key. You know, you know, every, I, you, know you, you hear past champions about being consistent. And I think that's what he's done. Exactly the same as what Prado done. They've they done what they needed to do. And he maintained that lead uh, really well for out. Yeah, obviously listening and absorbing those voices in his corner like Cairoli and Smets. One thing, listening and absorbing and learning and then the next thing's doing it. So pretty impressive, I guess. Your thoughts on him? Yeah, it's. Uh, I, I am very impressed with Andrea all year. Really, I did not expect him to be your MX2 World Champ. I, I really didn't. But the more I, you know, learned and the more I asked around, um, it's not shocking when you know when you really commit and you basically tell a, a guy like you know Tony Caroli, like, hey, I'll, I'll do whatever whatever is necessary, right? Like, I'll the the workload is going to bear results, you know, barring injury. Um, there are not many people that are willing to, to go all in and, and do whatever it takes on the level of the, the best guys in the sport. So uh, for Tony to give him praise, like he did, I knew he was doing the work because those guys reserve praise like that for those that deserve it. Um, they, they've just seen so many riders come and go, some lazy, some that are not committed. They are more interested in chasing women or, whatever, right. They just don't want to do what's necessary. So uh, when Tony went out of his way to talk about all the the work that was being put in, that kind of changed my perspective on Andrea. Um, But I I do think it sets up really interestingly for 2024. Um, I don't think it's a situation where anyone's going to go in and be unbeatable. Uh, I really felt like Yago was the rider to beat and without injury, I still believe that to be the case. I still think he was the best rider. But for whatever reason, they just could not find a way to keep him healthy throughout a season. 
And in many years you look at it and say, okay, well, maybe he wasn't the best rider, right? Tom Vial and Prado and these riders like, yeah, I understand it. Like he maybe wasn't the best rider in those scenarios, but this year I believe he was the best rider and this was the time. And, and it's, I don't think this is one a year that he'll forget. Like he, I think he's going to think about this year for a really long time. There's nothing he can do about it, but I, he'll always feel like this one got away. Uh, it's just, that's just part of racing. 